For the past two decades, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has dominated the geopolitics of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Last month, in April 2016, a four-day-long skirmish erupted which cost the lives of at least 200 soldiers. In a previous Caspian report, we explained the geopolitical and military status quo. We also recounted how the conflict is a potential hotspot that could involve regional players such as Russia and Turkey. Given the geopolitical significance of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the lack of proper materials on the subject, in this report we will go over the origins of the conflict. My name is Shirvan and this is Caspian Report. For more information on the channel, please visit the Patreon page. The history of Azerbaijanis and Armenians in Karabakh is a complicated one. A number of studies show that the genetic traces of both ethnicities are actually closely intertwined. The languages, religions and customs may have changed over time, but in essence both communities, along with many other ethnic groups, share the heritage of the Caucasus region. This narrative is not accepted by the national paradigms. In fact, each side tries to belittle the history of the other. But both nations had lost their independent kingdoms centuries ago to neighboring empires. Yet, what Armenians and Azerbaijanis consider their lands lies right at the crossroads of empires. For centuries, the Ottoman Sultans, the Iranian Shahs and the Russian Tsars contested the lands in the South Caucasus and fought many wars over it. During the territorial exchanges, the borders were redrawn, the names of towns were renamed and every empire tried to change the demographics in their favor by deporting and settling ethnic groups. Even though the South Caucasus lived under the shadows of empires, the locals usually got along fine. Azerbaijanis who share linguistic ties with Turkey and a Shia Muslim creed with Iran coexisted with Oriental Orthodox Armenians who share the regional customs. Then, in the 19th century, the Russian Empire broke the power balance and annexed Iran's portion of the Caucasus. This included the region of Karabakh, which means Black Garden in the Azerbaijani language. Following this, the Russians conducted demographic surveys in the newly conquered territories to assess the strategic needs. The earliest objective demographic survey of the Karabakh region dates to 1823. According to the statistics, 91% of the population was Muslim and the remainder was Christian. This obviously refers to Muslim Azerbaijanis and Christian Armenians. The Russians proceeded to abolish the former Iranian provinces and created new ones. What is now Azerbaijan and Armenia were part of three provinces. The Baku Governorate, the Elizabeth Pol Governorate and the Yerevan Governorate. The last demographic survey in these provinces was conducted in 1897 and the ethnic layout was as the following. First, 58.7% of the Baku Governorate consisted of ethnic Azerbaijanis while Armenians formed 6.3%. Second, the Elizabeth Pol region had an Azerbaijani population of at least 60.8% and an Armenian population of 33.3%. Finally, the third province, the Yerevan Governorate, consisted of 37.8% Azerbaijanis and 53.3% percent Armenians. Within these provinces were secondary administrative divisions called Uyezds. This is where things get even more complicated. For example, even though ethnic Azerbaijanis formed the overall majority in the Elizabeth Pol Governorate, the ethnic layout of the Shushinsky region consisted of 53.3% Armenians and 45.3% Azerbaijanis. At the same time, the population of the Yerevan Uyezd, which is now the capital of Armenia, consisted of 51.4% Azerbaijanis and 38.5% Armenians. Another example is the Nakhchivan region, which was part of the Yerevan governorate but had a 63.7% Azerbaijani majority and a 34.4% Armenian minority. 
even though the demographic layout changed over time, these administrative arrangements remained in place until the Russian Civil War in 1917. These numbers are the earliest objective demographic observations of the region, and they show just how widespread and intermingled both communities lived. When the Russian Empire collapsed in 1917, Azerbaijanis and Armenians, along with neighboring Georgians, seized the opportunity and declared a unified Transcaucasian state. However, nationalist sentiment was running high and the concept didn't last as all three nations dismantled in independent states. Since the territorial boundaries were still based on the Russian governorates and uyezds, territorial disputes followed. Georgia and Armenia waged a brief war in which Armenia gained the Lori province, which until 1917 was part of the Tbilisi governorate, but a much larger war erupted between Azerbaijan and Armenia over a number of territories including Sumarlu, Yerevan, Zangazur, Nakhchivan and Karabakh. At the time, most of the international community had recognized Sumarlu and Yerevan as part of Armenia and Nakhchivan, Zangazur and Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. Regardless of this, revolts appeared all over the region. What's more is that at the time, Baku was the largest oil producing region in the world. The strategic significance of oil attracted new empires to the region. The Ottoman and British empires attempted to gain influence and control the fates of the newly established Armenian and Azerbaijani republics. So the first Armenian-Azerbaijani war played out in the context of World War I. It was a blend of complex alliances, diplomatic negotiations, military raids and rogue generals as well as imperial ambitions. Both sides made gains and losses and at the backdrop of the war, Azerbaijani civilians were massacred and Armenian villages were pillaged. Eventually, in 1920, the Azerbaijani army managed to gain control over most of its territorial claims concerning Nakhchivan, Zangazur and Garabakh. However, in early April 1920, news reached the authorities in Baku that the Red Army was intent on conquering the oil-rich Azerbaijan. Baku faced a difficult decision and transferred all its military forces to fight off the Soviet invasion of Azerbaijan. Following this, the abandoned Azerbaijani positions in Zangazur and Garabakh were overrun by Armenian forces. But the situation was not to last. When the Red Army finished conquering Azerbaijan, they marched straight into Armenia and then Georgia. For the Caucasus, the short experience with independence came to an end. Following the Soviet conquest, the Bolsheviks established the Kafbiro in 1921. The committee, led by Stalin, was to supervise the subordination of the Caucasus into the Soviet Union. The authorities in Yerevan intended to use diplomacy to gain control over Nakhchivan, Zengazur and Garabakh, which had previously been recognized as part of Azerbaijan. Armenia proceeded to request the authorities in Moscow for territorial adjustments, and so the Kafbiro committee assessed the territorial claims by Armenia against Azerbaijan and then settled them. The committee ruled that for historic, demographic, economic and political reasons, the Karabakh region was to remain part of Azerbaijan. Nowadays, many media outlets inaccurately simplify the events by stating that Stalin gave Karabakh to Azerbaijan. However, the original document of the Kaf Bureau makes no mention of giving, transfer or annexation. It only mentions that Karabakh remained part of Azerbaijan. In essence, when the Soviet army invaded the region, they recognized the authority of Azerbaijan over Karabakh and later settled the conflict in favor of Baku. However, in 1923, as a compromise, Stalin made additional territorial changes as a means to maintain a power balance in the region. The Soviet authorities created the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region within Azerbaijan. The borders of this new autonomy were drawn specifically to establish an Armenian majority population. Furthermore, the region of Zengazur, despite having an Azerbaijani majority, was transferred to Armenia. And this transferred Nakhchivan into an exclave, which too was granted an autonomy within Azerbaijan. 
A complicated issue just got even more confusing. As the Azerbaijani and Armenian communities were integrated into the Soviet Union, the communist leaders of both republics continued their attempts to change the demographic layouts. Over the next few decades, ethnic Azerbaijanis from Zangazur and Yerevan were deported, as were Armenians deported from Nakhchivan. A region that was once home to multicultural communities gradually transformed into distinct modern nation-states. It took a long time before both communities learned to trust and cooperate with each other, but during the Soviet era, Azerbaijanis and Armenians lived and worked side by side. The reconciliation process was made easier due to the fact that both groups have much in common in terms of culture. In fact, there was a genuine friendship between the two communities. Yet, in the final years of the Soviet Union, the old feelings of mutual distrust and hostility re-emerged. Despite decades of peace and trust, it only took a small number of unfortunate events to reintroduce a full-blown conflict. It is for this reason that historians argue that the Russians had never settled the conflict, rather they had installed the conditions for a divide and rule strategy. It was the fear of an all-out war that kept the Soviet Union together and without Russian oversight, Armenians and Azerbaijanis were destined to wage another war. And that is exactly what happened in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Eventually, the relations reached a boiling point when the authorities in Nagorno-Karabakh voted for a unification with Armenia. Tensions between the two groups escalated. Azerbaijanis were deported from Armenia and ethnic Armenians became targets for nationalists in Azerbaijan. And the Soviet state media only made matters worse. Sporadic violence erupted all over the region. People were getting killed on both sides. The situation only worsened with the formal collapse of the Soviet Union. The status of affairs lasted from 1988 to 1992. Yet, despite all the violence, even in the early days of the conflict, both sides aimed to prevent a war. In fact, a consensus between Yerevan and Baku was reached in September 1991. Armenia renounced all its claims to Azerbaijani territory and this became known as the Zheliznavodsk Declaration. However, the peace treaty was disrupted when a peacekeeping delegation aboard a transport helicopter consisting of Russian and Kazakh observers, as well as a dozen high-ranking Azerbaijani state officials, was shot down. All the passengers were killed in the crash, and an investigation committee revealed that the helicopter was shot down from the ground by large caliber weapons. There are many conspiracy theories on the shootdown of the helicopter, ranging from Russian KGB interference to rogue generals, but what we do know for certain is that as a result of the sabotage, the peace treaty between Azerbaijan and Armenia was never ratified. As the conflict escalated, both sides started targeting civilians and committed various acts of war crimes and atrocities. The most infamous of these events was the Khojali massacre, in which the Russian 366th Motor Rifle Regiment was directly involved. The news of the massacre had such a profound impact that it forced the resignation of the Azerbaijani president Mutalibov, and as the level of hostility increased, former friends and neighbors became enemies. It seemed that war was unstoppable. Yet, cool heads still prevailed in Baku and Yerevan as both sides once again attempted to reconcile. This time, the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan met in Iran in what is now known as the Tehran Agreement. Both sides committed themselves to peace and agreed to withdraw their armies from the conflict zone. However, the peace efforts failed the very next day when Armenian troops, in breach of the Tehran Agreement, attacked and captured the Azerbaijani town of Shusha. Following this, the negotiations ceased and a full-scale war ensued. It's important to note that President Terpetrosyan of Armenia had not actually planned to double-cross his Azerbaijani counterpart. Rather, the Armenian president was not in control of his military forces. Someone else was calling the shots, and two times already a peaceful outcome had been sabotaged. But even at the time, it was evident that some third party was determined to force Azerbaijan and Armenia into a war and push out any Iranian influence by embarrassing Tehran's political efforts. 
ultimately the country that gained the most from these subversions was Russia. There is no evidence to prove this but many analysts consider either the KGB or the GRU responsible for instigating a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan as it made the South Caucasus more manageable for Moscow. Either way, the collapse of the peace talks paved the way for a full-scale war between Armenian and Azerbaijani troops. However, ever since the fall of Shusha, which is the most strategic point in Karabakh and the cradle of Azerbaijani culture, the political divisions in Baku deepened. An armed revolt ousted the acting president only to be replaced by the former communist president who too was replaced in an election and then the elected president was deposed in a coup. With the Azerbaijanis distracted in a political power play back in the capital, Armenian forces managed to push further and further ahead. Two years into the war and 30,000 to 36,000 deaths later, the Bishkek Protocol was signed in 1994 which calls for a ceasefire between the opposing sides. The ceasefire left Armenia in control of a substantial large territory. Not only did Yerevan control nearly all of Nagorno-Karabakh, but the country also seized seven adjacent Azerbaijani regions that were not part of the initial war goal. This brings the total size of occupied territories to nearly 11,500 square kilometers, which is far larger than Nagorno-Karabakh's 4,400 square kilometer terrain. The territorial changes were significant for both countries, however perhaps even more decisive were the demographic changes. As a result of the war, about 250,000 Azerbaijanis from Armenia fled to Azerbaijan and roughly another 600,000 Azerbaijanis fled the conflict zone in Karabakh to the remainder of Azerbaijan. This brings the total number of Azerbaijani refugees and internally displaced persons to about 850 thousand people. As for the Armenian side, an estimated 400,000 Armenians fled Azerbaijan and settled in Armenia and nowadays Nagorno-Karabakh is inhabited by about 146,000 ethnic Armenians. However, the total population spread over Karabakh taken as a whole is roughly 400,000 people. Following the ceasefire, diplomatic negotiations began. President Terpetrosyan and his Azerbaijani counterpart Aliyev were close to a compromise. A phased settlement was accepted by both leaders. Armenia was to return the occupied regions surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh and in return Azerbaijan would lift the blockade against Armenia. The status of Nagorno-Karabakh would be postponed and settled later on. However, Terpetrosyan was forced to step down by February 1998 by his Prime Minister Kocharyan. Kocharyan stalled the peace talks with Aliyev but a year later the two sides were close to a new deal. Armenia would return the territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh, international peacekeeping troops would be deployed and Nagorno-Karabakh itself would become an autonomy within Azerbaijan. This second agreement too was derailed in 1999 when a group of armed gunmen stormed the Armenian parliament killing eight and wounding dozens of Armenian officials. It was never explained what really happened or what had motivated the gunmen but in a 2005 interview former Russian FSB officer Alexander Litvinenko stated that the GRU, the military intelligence agency of Russia, was behind the shooting in an effort to derail the peace process progress which would have resolved the Karabakh conflict. No evidence was provided to support these allegations but nonetheless the peace talks were slowed down during the remainder of Kocharyan's presidency. It was only in 2007 when the peace talks gained momentum with the introduction of the Madrid principles. This roadmap was further updated in 2011 and it basically requires Armenia to withdraw its forces from the region and calls for peacekeeping forces instead. Following this, Nagorno-Karabakh would receive security guarantees and the region's legal status would be resolved through diplomacy. In the meantime, Armenia would temporarily maintain a corridor with Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan would lift the blockade against Armenia and communications between the two would be restored. 
For over a decade, the peace talks have been conducted along these lines, yet the talks are no step closer to a peace treaty. The reason for the passive negotiations is due to the changing geopolitics of the region. The fact is that energy-rich Azerbaijan's economy has skyrocketed and the country has forged close strategic relations with Turkey and Israel. Furthermore, Baku's diplomatic influence has expanded due to its groundbreaking energy policy and at the same time, Armenia has been absorbed into the Russian sphere of influence with Iran being the closest geopolitical alternative. Essentially, in the duration of the peace talks, the regional geopolitics have shifted. Today, there exists an asymmetric balance between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Yerevan wants to maintain the status quo whilst Baku seeks to use its new leverage to overthrow the stalemate. The dynamic geopolitical circumstances combined with the lack of trust have resulted in the forestallment of a peace treaty. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. I want to thank the following people for their contributions on Patreon. Their support and that of many others have made this report possible. For more information on supporting the channel, please visit patreon.com slash Caspian report. For now, thank you for watching and Saul.